say that he's the pastor of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Messick, Michigan, and he's written these two books, and then I guess that would be it. So join me in welcoming Dr. Ben Thompson. Thank you. I don't want to scare you with the first slide. Uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate that. I don't speak nearly as often as I used to um, since the cancer, but, uh, but every now and then I get out, and I'm, I'm thankful my wife let me out today. That's my wife sitting over there in the purple dress. But uh, I, I carry this around with me, and I was interested because I, the first thing a lot of people tell me is uh, that God's not in the Constitution. And I say, it's even better than that because my Lord Jesus Christ is in the Constitution. They go, what in the world are you talking about? And then I, so I go to Article 7, uh, done in convention by unanimous consent of the states present, the 17th day of September in the year of our Lord. Which Lord is that? 1,787. So if you go back 1,787 years, you know which Lord they were talking about. And that's my Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And they did it in unanimous consent. You say, well, that's how they labeled everything back then. It's really not. If you go through some of the others, uh, some of the other uh, uh, resolutions they did, even in Congress back then, uh, none of the others list the year in that way. Just our Constitution does. I thought that was incredible by itself. Uh, just a, a caveat, I'm not an attorney. Uh, someone asked me once, uh, are, are you a lawyer? And I says, are you calling me a liar? They said, no, no, lawyer. And I said, it's the same thing. <clears throat> but uh, uh, I have a law degree, but I didn't, didn't want to take the bar because I didn't want to be under the, that group scrutiny. And uh, the Ecclesiastical Law Center, we use attorneys when we need to, when we need to take some cases to court. Um, but generally, we stay out of the court system uh, because the uh, churches that we unincorporate are no longer legal entities that can go into court. And we have several cases concerning that. But uh, let, let me just get right on into it. By the way, the book approved by man, this is the one that Dr. Wright and I uh, wrote for... Uh, for lay people, the other one we wrote for to actually to go into the Library of Congress and to send them to uh, the Congress Congress folks that we have in Washington D.C. about our that's our whole uh, uh, background of what unincorporation is and how churches incor started incorporating here in this. But this is more for the lay person. It's proved by man, a case for biblical reasonableness. It goes behind the scenes of the law center and tells how we do cases. It has nine cases in here that we've done. Um, I, I had it open to the history of church tax deductions in 501c3. I'll get into that a little bit now, especially with the Johnson Amendment. Uh, there's the uh, history of church property tax exemption, and some of the times, even in our country's history, when that was done away with, uh, like during the war. Uh, I have, uh, is the Internal Revenue Service after the church? I'll be presenting some of those things here also. Um, and then... Uh, uh, oh, you can, you can leaf through one back there. If you don't want to buy it, just take it out to uh, a Staples or a copy mount and just copy it all. It'll be cheaper that way, I'm sure. No, uh, I, uh, the, the publisher said I need to at least get 10 bucks out of it. I don't even, I've never bought one of these myself, but it's $23.99 on the back, so 10 bucks is pretty reasonable if, if it interests you. And uh, I really like the book because I wrote it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I have been, uh, I've spoken to groups like this for many, many years, and I know there's a plethora of different backgrounds here, and I understand that. And uh, basically, basically, we, uh, we love our country, we love the Constitution, I understand that too. Uh, most of you uh, would, would say that you're believers in Jesus Christ, that your sins have been forgiven, He died on the cross for you. Of course, I pastor a church, and that's my main function that He's left me in this life, even going through cancer. He left me here to, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. Uh, but uh, I know there are other, other ones here. And as I ask myself, well, who is our enemy? And if you look at the list up there, uh, you could probably say amen to about all of these. And, and I've tried to do background studies on all of them. I, I don't know who this guy is here, but uh, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll discuss him a little bit later. But uh, who, is, who is the enemy? Is it really the IRS or is it something more behind that? Uh, is it the judges? The courts are so corrupt, people tell me. It's, you know, who is really our enemy? Well, well, let me hone it down here just a little bit, because right now here in Wisconsin, uh, a couple months ago, was the, uh, the Freedom From Religious Foundation versus the, the director of the IRS right now. He's, he's on the hot seat now, isn't he? I love it when they're on the hot seat. 
I do. I, I love this whole thing coming out. This whole there's not a smidgen of scandal, is there? But I love it when the when the not a smidgen starts coming out, and the IRS goes back into their hole, and they say, well, let's just back off right now. But uh, but this was the uh, uh, what what the the letter the IRS sent to the Freedom from Religion Foundation. And uh, let's see, I've got I've got the decision in order here. Um, written by the judge or signed by the judge uh, Lynn Adelman uh, concerning this and uh, you can read it you can read it afterwards if you'd like and if you want to take a copy home that's fine I just uh, ran it off this morning but uh, it was uh, it was an agreement to dismiss the lawsuit um, because they had a behind the, the, the door behind the scenes meeting uh, saying that yes we will start going after churches uh, we've been laying off, and, and you have to understand why they're laying off of churches. Uh, the first thing is they don't have a whole lot of agents that are tied to uh, uh, churches. And secondly, even if they caught one, they're not going to get anything out of it. They're not going to get any money out of it. And why go after 10,000 churches when the end result is you're not going to get any money out of it? So it's pretty logical. But they're being forced to do it. And uh, I wanted to refer to just uh, one of the paragraphs in there. It says, with regard to these referrals, I want to mention the referrals in a minute too, that concern violations of churches, the PARC, that's the Political Activities Referral Committee. The IRS actually has a Political Activities Referral Committee. And I have... uh, I have that right here, the document right here, the, the, all the ones in the IRS that's made up of that committee. Um, with regard to these referrals that concern violations by churches, the park has determined that as of June 23, 2014, 99 churches merit a high priority examination. Of these 99 churches, the number of churches alleged to have violated the prohibition during 2010 is 15, during 2011 is 18, during 2012 is 65, and you can see that they're more active during uh, election years. And during uh, 2013 is one. So 2013 was not an election year. Actually, the committee meets every, uh, every two years uh, on, on, in even years because they're not worried about the odd years. And you can see that, that it's a rare thing. And uh, also you need to know that the Holy Cross Anglican Church over here, um, uh, an actual a church, and I think the, the head guy is Malone, uh, actually tied himself into this so that the FFRF could have standing to actually take this case. They didn't have standing to take this case uh, because they, they, weren't, they weren't representing any churches. So this Anglican church said, hey, use us. And so that's why the, it could even go to, to court. Now, the judge said that the FFRF is satisfied that the tax authority no longer has a policy of non-enforcement specific to churches and religious institutions. So we know what the behind the closed doors meeting was all about. Uh, uh, they said, we'll drop this case if you will actively start going after churches. Um, the uh, co-director of the FFRF, Annie Laurie Gaylor, said this, Our victory ensures that churches are not being singled out for preferential treatment as they were with the IRS turning a blind eye to Pulpit Freedom Sunday. Pulpit Freedom Sunday, if you don't know anything about it, it's, it's, I think it's October 5th. And they try to get as many churches and pastors as they can to violate their 501c3 status and to preach election sermons, to go ahead and, and, and say who to vote for and all of that. They do it just to kind of poke the IRS in the eye. And so, uh, but they're saying that, hey, we're going to be very active in that. If you notice the cartoon on your website, of the pastor standing there outside the church and a guy with a briefcase that had an IRS on it and he said, Pastor, that's a fine sermon, but you'll be hearing from me. Uh, that, that's, that's a great cartoon, but that's really not how it happens. The IRS does not. Can you imagine an IRS agent sitting in a church with dark glasses on? And they, they don't do that, by the way. They don't have enough agents to do that. So they rely on uh, other groups to do that, like the FFRF, Some uh, really kind, nice-looking person from the FFRF can slip into a church, and uh, they'll they'll have their tape recorder, they'll take pictures of the bulletin board, and they're the ones that actually refer people to the IRS. Uh, The most popular group to do that was the Americans uh, uh, against the separation, or for the separation of church and state. That's Barry Lynn, Reverend Barry Lynn's group. Uh, He sends out about 50,000 people per year into churches Uh, for that purpose, so that they can refer, uh, if they see a a church going against what their 501c3 is, that they'll refer that church to the IRS. 
Uh, it doesn't happen a whole lot, by the way. And as you can see, they were up to 99 for the last four years. Uh, just the truth about the IRS and 501c3 organizations. I want to give you a little bit of the history in the background. Is the IRS attacking churches? Now, some of this was, uh, was uh, done at the Library of Congress by me, research uh, for this book. So it's, it's a little bit old. It's about 10 years old. But still, I found that it's, it's consistent with us. Uh, number one, how many nonprofit organizations are there in the United States? That'd be good for us to know, isn't it? The first question I wanted to ask. Well, there's a million, uh, roughly a million. How many, uh, how many church nonprofits are there? Most people can't answer that. So there's about 350,000. That means there's about 650,000 other types of 501c3. I don't know. You can research 501c4 if you want because all the information's out of there. Most of the information's from the IRS website, by the way. Uh, how many IRS employees are there? Okay, there's about 80,000, give or take. How many uh, IRS field agents are there? Well, there's about 20,000 okay, that they send out in the field when they need to. Um, how many IRS agents oversee nonprofit 501 organizations? Approximately 800. So there's a million, 350,000 churches for 800 employees to oversee. They can't get a whole lot of work done. Now, now, my theory as to why they were not granting 501c4 status to a lot of the Tea Party groups was because there was this massive movement. And by the way, I want you to know that everywhere I've gone, there is this ground roots movement, just like what you have here, that is against what's going on in Washington. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, they're, they're trying so hard to take Redskins off of Washington Redskins, aren't they? Uh, I think they ought to just take the Washington off and leave the Redskins because they're the problem. That's probably the corrupt word right there. But, but nonetheless, uh, uh, they just they don't have the agents to do that. They have to rely on other groups. And the FFRF is one of those groups that said, you can rely on us. We will help. By the way, the head of the FFRF over in uh, Madison uh, is a former pastor. He's he's actually written some Christian songs, and is still getting uh, st still getting royalties from those Christian songs that he wrote. Uh, he's he's uh, re rejected Christ. He's gone away from all of that, and he's become an atheist. But nonetheless, uh, is the IRS attacking churches? And my answer is no. But they're relying on other people to do their dirty work for them. In other words, they always have to. You can read through the political. A compliance initiative, uh, they address all referrals, it says, organizations participating in, intervening in a political campaign in behalf of, of, uh, uh, of uh, or in opposition to a candidate for public office. And it goes into how they, how they do everything, all their procedures, type A, type B, type C, and the letters they write to organizations like this one and like churches, to non-churches and churches. And uh, they give uh, examples of large churches that are not complying, and, and it goes on and on. So, let's talk about their mission. What is the IRS's mission? Well, of course, it's money. They want money. I sit all the time uh, in, uh, in uh, local county uh, property tax assessor's offices because they want to tax a church property that's an unincorporated church. And as a matter of fact, in the back of this book, we have a 1991 Attorney General opinion from, uh, from the Attorney General of Indiana, Lindley Pearson, uh, who's a wonderful Christian man. And he, he even said in that that there's a difference between a corporate church and a non-incorporated non church uh, in the law and that uh, we'd have better standing in the Supreme Court by, by not being incorporated. But, uh, but that was on property taxation and says that you don't have to fill out the form to be exempt from property taxation. Just notify them you're a church. But, but I've sat in these offices and they, I've had, I had an assessor over in Indiana tell me, a, a, a woman, she said, uh, you know, I wish every church in this whole county I wish their property were taxed because we could really use the money. See, that's their bottom line. They don't care if the Constitution is blown up. They want the money. So that's their mission. Now, uh, this is a 19, uh, 2004, but it's been pretty consistent since then. One in six large corporations were audited fiscally in 2004. 
Uh, total individual aud audits were over 1 million in 2004, a 40% increase, mostly those who make over 100,000. So that means most of us are gonna be okay, right? <clears throat> oh, I am. Uh, criminal investigations were up 20% in 2004, more than 3,000 criminal investigations. And then they collected $43.1 billion from these groups that they audited. So they know when they go and audit a, a major corporation, they're going, to find, they're going to find problems and they're going to get a lot of money from those. They go after those organizations that they can get money from. If there's not a whole lot of money there, they'll, they, they don't even, by the way, it's up $37.6 billion in 2003. Uh, now, let's go a little, a little bit background. Some of you probably don't remember Lyndon Johnson, do you? Yep. Oh, I'm in the right group. All right, let's, let's, let's have a praise song for Lyndon Johnson. What is this Johnson Amendment? Okay, well, in the first 200 years of our country, pastors preach freely about anything, including politics. Did you know that? I mean, I have, a li I have several in filed of election sermons from early America that every, every October and November, pastors would be preaching election sermons. You know, they'd be going to the scriptures and saying, you ought to vote for a guy because he's this and because he's this and because he's this. That's how we start out. Pastors and churches, they also supported or opposed candidates from their pulpits as early as, as 1800. We can find, uh, find that happening in pulpits across the, uh, the, the, the uh, early colonies. They were, telling, they were telling their congregations who they should vote for and who they should not vote for. Well, that changed in 1954. That's the Johnson Amendment. Let me give you some background. In 1948, the Texas Senate race was between LBJ and Coke Stevenson. This earned Johnson the nickname Landslide Linden. And it was, it was because Coke Stevenson was ahead by 112 votes. You know, you were talking about the ballots and counting the ballots. and wondering. <clears throat> Folks, corruption has been around for a long time, especially in certain parties, but we won't mention that, will we? Uh, see, there was the infamous ballot, ballot box 13 that they suddenly found at the last minute, and it had 201 votes in it. 200 were for Lyndon Johnson, one vote for Stevenson, and so Johnson won the, his first Senate race in 1948 by 87 votes. He declared at that point in time, this will never happen again to me. I will never be the laughing stock of my party. I'm going to go to Washington, and they're not going to refer to me as Landslide Linden ever again. So you had the 1954 race. He was going against Dudley Doherty. And you see even on Dudley's uh, uh, election that, that says Linden's record on the back. Ooh, can they do that now? I don't know if they can do that now. I know you can make smear campaigns on TV, but they were handing these things out. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me, let me show you a couple of guys. There was H.L. Hunt. Remember, he was the, the Texas uh, um, multimillionaire, the, the oil man. He started the facts for him in 1951 because he was so opposed to Lyndon Johnson. He thought, uh, he thought Lyndon Johnson was easy on communism. And uh, so he, as a matter of fact, I think he put out from 1951 to 54, he put out 82 million pieces of paper against Lyndon Johnson to try to not get him reelected. Another guy you might know of, the, the newspaper mogul, Frank Gannett, he started the Committee for Constitutional Government in 1935. These were really our grassroots, our first constitutional organizations funded by these multimillionaires back then. They were both in Texas, the Committee for Constitutional Government and the Facts Forum, and they were both against Lyndon Johnson. Well, Johnson came up with an idea to muzzle these organizations. He said, uh, we need to rewrite the 501c3. Now, you get the book, you can read what it was before and how it didn't apply to any organization, not even this organization. It didn't apply to churches especially. But nonetheless, he said, we need to muzzle these organizations. So on July 2nd, 1954, he stood up on the Senate floor and he said, I have an amendment, uh, President, I have an amendment to the massive tax overhaul bill, and it's an amendment to 501c3. And do you see the July 2nd, most of the senators had already flown back home for the independence holidays. The only ones that were there, I know that because it was a unanimous voice vote, were the ones that Lyndon Johnson wanted there to vote on this amendment. Johnson declared to the president, 
of the Senate there that the sponsor of the tax bill agreed to it. Now, by the way, that was not accurate, but you know, they can say anything they want on the floor of the Senate. But most senators had already headed home for Independence Day. Only Johnson senators were there. So there was a unanimous voice vote to 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, uh, Eisenhower signed it into law on August 6, 1954, just in time for Lyndon Johnson to be able to go out. He tried for three years to go after these two, uh, the, the Facts Forum and, and, and the Constitutional Committee. He tried for three years to go after them in court. And the, the courts ruled that they didn't do anything wrong. They didn't violate the IRS, their, any, anything, any laws. And so Johnson had to come up with this amendment so that he could go after those two in court and uh, back them off. Well, he won again, of course. And, you know, the next year he became the, the youngest Senate majority leader that our, that our country's ever had. And then what happened about... Uh, Four years later, or five years later, he became the Vice President of the United States. Uh, seems like I've seen this television program, but <clears throat> I didn't get any laughs, so that's fine. <laughs> now, the Johnson Amendment, they had no committee hearings, no legislative analysis. There was no attempt to understand the effect the bill would have on constitutional right of churches or pastors. As a matter of fact, years later, uh, well, here, here's what he said on the, on the Senate floor. Mr. President, I have an amendment at the desk which I should like to have stated, and the Chief Clerk read it. On page 170 of the House bill in section 501c3, it's proposed to strike out individual as an insert individual. Strike out influence legislation, in, insert influence legislation, and which does not participate in or intervene in any political campaign on behalf of any candidate for public office. That's what was added. That's what became the Johnson Amendment and the 501c3. So that it would muzzle everyone that would speak out against him. And it was a personal thing. He took these things personally. Uh, years later, George Reedy, uh, by the way, about 20 years later, uh, he was an aide to uh, Johnson back in 1954. And he said, Johnson never had churches in mind when he proposed this amendment. He only went after those two political organizations that were after him. And so that's where we got 501c3. What has the IRS passed? Well, since 501c3 came into to being by Congressman, L, uh, by, excuse me, Senator LBJ in 1954, two churches have had their tax exemption revoked. That's not a whole lot. I can count to two. Five religious organizations have lost their tax exemption. Let me give you the two churches. Number one, you might remember these. Branch Ministries Incorporated, Pastor uh, Dan Little, Church at Pierce Creek, 1992. They took out a big USA Today full-page ad against Bill Clinton. You remember that? The problem is he asked for donations to, uh, to Church at Pierce Creek at the bottom, and that really got the IRS irate. And they, wrote, they, did, they did what they were supposed to do back then. They wrote him a letter, said, you're in trouble, and we're going to meet with you. They met with him. They told him. They slapped him on the wrist. They fined him, and they took back that fine, by the way. And two days later, he had his 501c3 not, nonprofit status back. He said, I'll never do that again. <laughs> that was a one-time thing. And the IRS, when, when you fall and grovel at the IRS's feet and say, I'll never do anything again, they love it. And then, uh, you know something that happened uh, back in 1999 and 2000, the Indianapolis Baptist Temple case. Over in Indianapolis, uh, Dr. Greg Dixon, uh, they fought the IRS because, well, they were unincorporated, but they were an unincorporated association, which still makes them a legal entity. At least that's what the judge determined back then. And uh, I've, I've read all the paperwork there because we were going to have to do an amicus brief uh, if it ever went to the Supreme Court. Um, <clears throat> really more in support of the opposition to them because they had a, they had a wrong standing. But nonetheless, that was pulled uh, at, at that point in time. Uh, and and just, just by way of understanding, there are about 250,000 others that were pulled, but that, be, that is when you don't fill out your, the file every year, after three years they pull their 501 status. Okay, so you've got to keep it current or they'll pull that. So that's the, that makes up the other 250,000 that have been pulled over the years. But that was only because they let it lapse. Now, what's the IRS future? Well, back in 2005, and it is still current too, the, uh, Mark Everson, the IRS commissioner, stated they'd be going after more and more small businesses and tax-exempt organizations. If, if you read this, 
how they how they deal with problems, uh, you know that they want to go after groups that at least have fifty thousand dollars or more per year. Okay. By the way, that doesn't take a church very long to have fifty thousand dollars. That's that's an offering of thousand dollars every week. You can be a church of a hundred people and get that kind of an offering every week. Uh, so it doesn't take very much. Uh, to do that, but still they want to go after the larger the group and the more they have money, that's the ones they want to go after. We'll go after more. And 2004, 100 501c3 organizations were referred to the IRS. Now, out of that, they, the IRS investigated 60 of them. The others they just wrote a letter to saying, hey, this is a first time thing. This is a warning to you. If we need to come after you, if we hear anything else, we'll investigate you. They investigated 60 of them, and 20 of them were churches. So my conclusion is, no, they're really not scrutinizing. I think I agree with the FFRF that the IRS really sees churches as this strange animal out here that we don't know. We're not, first, we're not going to get any money from them. You know, a church of 100 somewhere here in town, we're not getting any money from them. Uh, secondly, most of the people that have given in the offerings, they've already paid their taxes. So we're not going to win out there. So why do we have to spend all the time going after them? Well, the only reason now they're spending all the time going after them is because of these, what I would refer to as atheistic left-wing groups that are forcing them to go after them. And by the way, for some reason, we're the good guys. We don't ever go to the IRS and force them to go after those people, do we? (laughs) We don't force them to go after the liberal churches that have all the other, uh, (coughs) that, that really violate it. Uh, let me uh, let me leave a little bit of time for questions. And by the way, I did some research into the uh, into the um, um, homosexual uh, hiring laws that that uh, David mentioned earlier. And uh, the thing that I found about that, and I want Alexis to do this. There haven't been any cases decided as to what what that really means. Uh, a church has to have uh, their statement of faith. And the person they're hiring has to believe in the statement of faith. And if the church has in their statement of faith that they're against homosexuality because of the scriptures, then they certainly don't have to hire someone that way. That goes with any other organization, too. If you have what your organization is and what you agree on and agree to be against, you don't have to hire anybody. You don't have to hire anybody that you disagree with. Not even me. If you're against Baptist pastors... You can put that in your organizational documents, and uh, you don't even have to have me speak ever again. Isn't that good? (laughs) But you better be really careful if you are 501c4 or 501c3, be very careful as to your documents. That's one of the reasons why we unincorporate churches, and I, I have, my passion is to go to churches, not groups like this, but to go to churches and say, why do you need your 501c3? I mean, if you're going to give to God, give to God. Don't give to God and think the, the government's going to give you some back. Just get, I mean, if you're going to do that, just go ahead and take that back yourself and give the rest to your church. But why involve the IRS in this? And so give to God. And you know what? Uh, the pastors that have done this, we, I've helped to incorporate probably 200, 250 churches over the years. I've been the director of the Law Center for 27 years now. And, uh, and I know other groups that have done it, and I know there is a definite movement now to get churches to do away with their 501c3. And I, that's a good thing, because then we can finally stand up again as men of God like we used to in this country and say, don't vote for that guy. Don't vote for that gal. Okay? And... I would rather you vote for that. I, I usually don't tell people how to vote. I just usually tell them how I'm going to vote. <laughs> okay? Because I'm a citizen. I'm an individual, even when I stand in my pulpit. I can tell them how I'm going to vote. I don't have to tell them how to vote. But now that we're not incorporated, we're not 501c3, I can do that even. Is that cool or what? I love it. I love the freedom. And that's what pastors have, you know, pastors call me all the time. I had a pastor in in Charlotte, Michigan call me and say, you know, I'd like to do a sermon series uh, on on the biblical issue of homosexuality, but I'm afraid to because we're 501c3. (sighs) He's afraid to obey God (laughs) because the government has told him you can't talk about these things. 
Who are we supposed to obey, folks? God or man? Peter said we're supposed to obey God. Okay, I've left the rest of the time for questions. If you have any questions for me. Do I have a rest of the time? I don't even know. Yes, I do. Yes, good. Yes, over here. Yes. Uh, do you think that uh, the politicization of gay marriage and abortion uh, is being uh, used, the, the, the left is using that as a tool, as a tool to, to keep uh, uh, the church, churches from talking, from talking about it? I believe so, because then Christians become very shy. That you know, we hate to be hated. <laughs> Isn't that is that a misnomer? We hate to be hated. Uh, I want to be sound as reasonable. I mean, our book is even a case for biblical reasonableness. Uh, but the problem is, we do have biblical beliefs, and we're supposed to stand behind those, because the God that we serve is so much greater than the God that they serve. You know, the little G. They don't serve God, but 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 yes, I agree with you, and and we've seen that since 1991. 1991, uh, all of our ELC. Uh, uh, we had pastors and uh, meetings uh, across the country, and Dr. Wright and I would warn that, that someday the day is going to come when a homosexual couple is going to come into your church, and they're going to say, can we become a member? Can we, become, uh, can we join the choir? And you're going to have to know how you're going to deal with that. As a matter of fact, that happened over in a church in Lansing uh, about four or five years ago. Uh, they, 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 they picked that church because it's a large independent Baptist church and they just they wanted to set precedent there and so yes across this country there are homosexual couples that are targeting churches to go in there and if they say no you can't be a member they'll sue the corporation that's another reason why we unincorporate churches because uh, you can't sue or be sued if you're unincorporated so that's a good question though because that's very vital and that's happening right now yes Right, I just mentioned that. Yeah, KFUO radio station, uh -huh. St. Louis. I don't know how many years they fought the federal government on this exact issue. <clears throat> yeah. They revealed in the courts that it cost a, a great deal of money. Certainly. What that tells me is that, in fact, um, the government does wish to have control over you who you're going to hire and not hire. Yes, so they do. The that court case. Yes. So I just want to share it because. The other question, I think, what I see going on is more and more the attempt by government through its regulatory agency to control what the church is going to be allowed to speak and, and, and teach. Certainly. Yeah, and it's only uh, conservative churches, of course. So, but I, I agree with you in that, and and that's why I wanted to, you know, Wisconsin was one of the first ones that had the anti-discrimination laws uh, concerning homosexuals. And so, but, but interestingly enough, that has never been challenged here in this, in this state. Yes? Going along with what he just said, it uh, passes. Isn't that, that going to change the picture completely? And uh, Obama just made an executive order that the end of policy applies to federal employees as of now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the federal... Wow, is that a mess? I can't, I can't even I can't even deal with that. So <laughs> how do I deal with it? How do I deal with federal? Uh, because I don't I don't even I, I'm not under federal law, so I don't know. I'm a Michigander. Is that okay? Am I still welcome? Can I still eat? Well, what I'm saying is, yeah. if if the Congress passes in the yeah. sign into law, yeah, that is going to affect everybody. Yeah. Well, right now, being an executive order, I think we're okay. Because I don't think Congress is going to pass anything like that. Well, that's, well, that's not true. Yeah, <clears throat> especially after this next election. Well, we hope. We're all we're all praying about that, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Look what happened. Oh wow. Yeah. Well, I have my opinions on that, but you guys don't want to hear it. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, I know they were mentioning the gay marriage and homosexuality. Yes. One way they're bringing that forward is through the schools. I'm wondering if you've done any work with um, religious schools and helping them. <sighs> oh, I am very big into homeschooling. We homeschool our kids, and uh, most of the families in our church, I think all of them, homeschool their kids. 
And uh, there's a the, the homeschool movement is huge, especially in Michigan. Once the uh, De Jong case was uh, went to the Michigan Supreme Court back in 1991, and they determined that no parents have a right have a biblical right to educate their children at home. And then homeschooling in Michigan, it was as tight as possible because every homeschool teacher had to be teacher certified by the state. And so that's what that exploded and said, no, you don't. And then homeschooling is just mushroom. I, I'm assuming it's, it is here too, isn't it? I'm assuming people are homeschooling left and right. And so that's, that's really the only way to, to go around it because we have no control over the public education anymore, the government education. Do you think that homeschooling has control over the curriculum that's going to be taught when you got Common Core coming through? Yeah. Uh, I know. I know. Right now, that uh, a couple of the Christian uh, uh, curriculum makers, uh, Abeka, said they're not doing Common Core. They've already decided that. I think Bob Jones, that curriculum, has decided not to do Common Core. And so there's going to be such a resistance to that in the Christian education that I don't know how they're going to get that through. You know, you, you can say, okay, everybody's guilty of something and we're going to all jail you, but the practical reality of that is they don't have enough jails. And that's the same thing I would say with some of these other issues that, okay, they can pass Common Core if they want, but the practicality of it is there's going to be a Supreme Court that's going to shoot it down, Wisconsin Supreme Court or something, because it's just not constitutional. If it gets high enough, I think they'll shoot it down. That's my opinion. Yes? Yes. Yeah, freedom. Uh huh. The freedom issue. Um, my understanding that ADF has sent all these pastors to extend the sermons and yes. the IRS yes. listen to what I did. Yeah. And they have never challenged Yeah. Yeah. Is that because they're fearful of. Well, they're fearful, and, and it's because of the scandal with 501c4 now. But they've been fearful the last, I think, six years they've been doing it because there are just so many of them that do it. Uh, personally, as a pastor, I don't want to put my finger in the IRS's eye and say, come after me. But if there are enough of them that do that, there's nothing the IRS can do about it. The only thing they can do is try to make an example out of some of the larger churches. And once they slap those down and assess penalties to them, pull their 501c3, scare their whole congregations that say you're not going to get any tax-deductible gifts, then those pastors may kowtow. But as of now, I don't know any that are. Uh, I know back in, when I researched it for our book back in uh, 2004, that was the 20 churches that they actually went after were pastors that did that on that, on that Sunday. Yes? Well, ADF is, uh, I think they're, we're ambassadors for ADF. Oh, good. Okay. And they're not just really trying to poke the IRS in the eye. They think the Johnson Amendment is unconstitutional. I agree. But they can't make it unconstitutional until they have somebody willing to carry the ball. That's exactly so right. Take it up to the yeah. Supreme Court yeah. and declare it yes. unconstitutional. One other thing about the ADF that you might be interested in carrying back to your churches sure. is that they also have prepared a paper and they're encouraging churches to put things in their bylaws to protect them from lawsuits on this hiring issue. So if any of you want that, <coughs> yeah, you can get that off their website, I yeah. believe. Get, get yeah, that, get that to your church councils and pastors and protect yourself on that issue. Yeah, if you have an incorporated church, that would be very wise to do that. Of course, when I unincorporate churches, uh, the only constitution bylaws we have is the King James Bible, and so that's that's really tough. You know, uh, courts can usually rule on, const on the Constitution and bylaws issue that makes it an entity the court can see. Uh, they, uh, I had a pastor three months ago in court, and the judge asked him, well, where are your man-made documents that prove you're an entity? And he said, Your Honor, we don't have any. He held up his King James Bible and says, this is the only thing the church goes by. And the judge said, uh, uh, I don't know what to do now. <laughs> so, so yeah, if, if you have an incorporated church, it'd be wise to listen to them and go on, on, on their website and, and make sure your constitution and bylaws state that, especially about homosexuality, being against that. And I mean, there's more, so much more than just, you know, Jesus Christ, Son of God, we believe in the Trinity, that have to go in those constitution and bylaws nowadays. Yes? We had both of the candidates for, for our 6th district race in our church, some Democrat and Republican, could we as a church, do you think there'd be any risk if we had an event 
you know, a debate or, or any kind of event, uh, you know, it's a 501 church. Yeah. Well, you you wouldn't be at risk for anything if there were someone if, if there were no one there to turn you in. So, and that's that's another reason why they're sending their messages in because they want to make sure, hey, we're doing this. Come after us if you want. I, I really would think the ADA would be wise to pick out a like like the ACLU does. They pick out a judge, they pick out the right church, and they just challenge it right going right through and. Uh, that's how the ACLU's made a living. So they pick out the exact judge they want and the right couple. And, and uh, so it's, it's better than having, you know, a thousand pastors send in and then the IRS picks some obscure guy that really, I don't know what I'm doing. It'd be better to set that up is what I'm saying. And they may be doing it. That's, that's why, you know, they're wise enough to be able to do that. They know. They know better than I do. Yes? Regarding the... Uh Provision from the Workforce Development yes. website. Are you aware of any other states where, even though Wisconsin doesn't have any case law trying to take advantage of what I think is some pretty loose wording mm -hmm. that is worrisome, do yeah. you have any other states where that has been pushed forward? Well, the the good thing about the Wisconsin law is its ambiguity. Uh, they'd have to they'd have to prove, and, and I looked at those words, and boy, those that's that's tough for a judge. <laughs> uh, well, it, it's so ambiguous and. And so, no, I don't know any other states that have even tested that. Not that, that, that there haven't. I just, I did the research on it, and I don't know any other states that have done that. So, okay. Yes. Oh, ladies first. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, I didn't. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. All right. You said that when they went to unincorporated status, that they couldn't be sued. Would they then go back to the, to the board? If they have a board. That's another thing that we do away with because trustees are not in the scriptures. And so a trustee is only, is only an agent for the state of Wisconsin to hold the property of a 501c3 or an incorporated entity. A corporation is a creature of the state. We know that. Many court cases have decided that. Uh, they, they're created under state law. They're the corporate statutes here and the Wisconsin statutes annotated. And uh, as to how to do that, and, and churches volunteer to become under that, so that then they can apply for 501c3, they can get an EIN number and get a bank account, things like that. And so, uh, so uh, again, many court cases have said that an unincorporated church or entity cannot sue or be sued. <clears throat> so they don't recognize the entity. A judge can't. You know, justice is blind. They can only see those entities that, that the state has created. So if, if you're not an entity the state's created, supposedly, and we've, we've also had cases that have shown that, a uh, case uh, la two years ago in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, they took a church to court. It was Bible Baptist Church of Phoenix because they had a gravel parking lot and a multimillionaire uh, was having all of his uh, uh, water run down off his mountain onto this parking lot. The men of the church put up a four-foot wall, and so the multimillionaire sent the bureaucrats after him and said they have a gravel parking lot, no ADA parking you know, things up close to the church for, for disability people. And so the bureaucrat went after him, called the church into court. I told the pastor, go into court. You don't need an attorney, by the way. But uh, go into court and just tell the judge you're not incorporated. So he did. He went into court. Pastor Bessina said, we're not incorporated. The judge said, you're not? He went, no, we're not. You don't have any officers? No, we don't. We don't have any trustees? No, we don't have any. Get out of here. We don't want to hear this. So uh, so he kicked it. He took it. Uh, Two months later, they brought the pastor individually as the one that should take care of the parking lot. They brought him back in. Brother Bacinus went back in. Uh, the same judge said, uh, what are you doing here? He says, well, they now are trying to attach me personally, and I'm not an officer of the church. I'm not, I'm, uh, and by the way, a pastor is not a legal representative for a church. And so the, the uh, judge kicked it out again, says, okay, just get out of here. They brought him back again and found him guilty. We appealed it to the Northern Court of Appeals in, in Arizona, and the Northern Court of Appeals didn't want to hear this church-state issue. They remanded it back to trial. They picked their own judge. The, court, the, the, the Arizona Court of Appeals picked their own judge to hear the case. Pastor Bacinus, the bureaucrats went in. Uh, the lady judge heard the case. And she said, this is, this is something that we, we don't want to rule in. This is a separation of church and state. She looked at the bureaucrat, and she said, don't you ever go on that church property ever again, and you leave those people alone. Case dismissed. So that's what I'm saying. That's, that's, that's what happens when you're not a government entity. 
And so that's why it's, it's worth it to me to not be 501c3 and give tax deductible gifts. I don't do that in, in our church. The people of our church give to God. Yes? So in that instance, how is the money managed and all those other stuff? Oh, you have to get our books to find out that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're, we're late already. I mean, for, for crying out loud. <laughs> Hey, it's only it's only ten bucks. I mean, it's hardback. I'll sign it so that when I die from cancer, you can put it on eBay and make make your ten bucks back at least. Yes. You know, there's a lot of pressure here, uh, uh, pastors out there who are really socialists who teach you know the poor gay yeah. people. Yeah, and I understand. Other stuff. Probably and true. The, and them are the ones that are doing more speaking from the pulpit than anything. Yeah, probably. I think I think you ought to write them letters. All right, we better uh, stop it thank there. You. I guess. Thank you. Bless your heart. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Good. I'll leave these up here if you want to read them, read through them. Yeah, there's several angles. I've